You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple. Just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop, that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place, and you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply, awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident fanalist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore daddy. We are broadcasting, as always, from the Vivid Seats studios. Use promo code OVERTIME on the Vivid Seats mobile app to save up to $100 on all ticket purchases. First time customers only. So in all seriousness, um, I know people kind of have what we call in the industry alarm fatigue, kind of tune out advertisements. But if you are going to the game or any game or event or whatever, just punch in the code, see if it saves you a little bit of money. But today is going to be somewhat of a a, uh, a grab baggy kind of day because there's a lot of little tiny bits of information floating out there, Uh, one of which is the Trevor Davis thing. However, I did a mini pod on that yesterday. Um, The only new information is that we got a sixth round pick in return, which I think is decent value. I'll... uh... I guess briefly touch on that, but if you want a more, a, a fuller understanding what what I think that is, yesterday's little five minute podcast thing. Couple preliminaries I want to touch on before we get into things. First of all, I don't know if I've thanked anybody this month for um, either jumping in on or increasing their their Patreon um, support. So very quickly, Eric Thousandth Son, sweet name. David, Sean, Will, Dylan, Joe, David. I don't know why some of these are repeating, but thank you twice, David. Actually, I think that's everybody. This is repeated twice. I don't know why. But anyways, anybody this month that has uh, shown some support on there, I really do appreciate that. I'm trying as hard as I can. I know I, you you know that it drives me nuts. You have to know this if, if you know me well enough. It's absolutely making me crazy that I don't have videos up in that Facebook group every single day. But um, it's it's difficult because I also have that draft podcast, and then sometimes I just can't do anything after work because we got stuff going on. So I got to kind of pick and choose when I have the time, what I'm going to be doing. But uh, anybody that's offering any amount, I really do appreciate that. And I figure since that money is going towards things like Game Pass anyways, I want to be able to utilize that to your benefit. Uh, Game Pass and Pro Football Focus and all that stuff. So anyways, just wanted to say thank you for that. Um, I wanted to also mention that it's a little bit of a clunky system that I got. I'm trying to make sure that everybody's in the right place. So if you're um, giving anything in Patreon, then you're welcome to join our CBS Pick and Pool, which is basically you just pick which teams you think are going to win. If you want to play, cool. If you don't, cool. But if you do and I haven't invited you or sent you a link or anything, please reach out and let me know. Also, anybody giving the um, 10 bucks a month, can come into the Patreon or the, the Pack Daddy Premium page. I've had some requests to join it because it's just a Facebook group, and I didn't recognize the name, so I declined it. If you're giving money and you're trying to get in and I'm declining you, just reach out and be like, hey, man, this is my name on Patreon, you know, whatever. I, I give a false name to Patreon because they're secret government spies or, or whatever the situation is. Just let me know. Um, but anyways, and then lastly, and I'm I'm probably the only one but i'm super excited about this i created a brand new game out of thin air this is an idea i had a long time ago back before i had any kind of audience or anything and i was like i'm just going to create this website it's going to be sweet um come to find out number one i don't know how to build websites number two i don't have money to pay people to build websites 
Number three, this this actually already existed somewhere, and it wasn't very popular. Not a lot of people did it, and the website shut down, so that discouraged me a bit. But now, we're going to do it for fun, because I just want to. Now, full disclosure, this very likely will get moved into uh, the Patreon group, just because it's, you know, a lot of work per person, and I can't have hundreds of people doing it. But for this week only, I would like as many people as possible to want to jump in just to see how it goes, work out some of the kinks, see if you enjoy it or not, or if you think this is a dumb game. But basically what it is, and you need to get into the Facebook group to see the video and and, and participate, because that's where I posted it. Link is in the description. It is going to be a Green Bay Packer stock market game. And essentially what it is, is I'm using PFF grades to assign a price, and the price is based on what they've done currently, right? Just like the the stock market would be. Some stocks are really high, some stocks are really low. Your job is to buy shares of a certain stock with the intention of that stock rising in week three. Because when week three comes, I'm going to um, adjust the values of that stock based on what they did in week three. The video is a better explanation, so go check that out if you're somewhat interested. But then based on on how much your stock has gone up or down, you will have made or lost more money, and you start with $1,000, right? So you spend that fake $1,000, and then if your money goes up or money goes down, whatever, and then we'll find out who has the most money at the end of the week. Does that kind of make sense? Whatever. I'm I'm a nerd, and this kind of game is is a lot of fun to me. It's it's like a Packers online monopoly. I don't know. But get in the Facebook group to participate. All I need to know is um, how many shares of which player you would like, and I'll take over from there. Anyways, let's take our first break, and uh, we'll get into the goodness. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple. Just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop, that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place, and you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply. Awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. So let me start with the Trevor Davis thing. Just a very, very brief summary. Again, the details, well, my, my initial thoughts uh, you can find yesterday. But ultimately, I think that this was a, a good value. A lot of people are kind of upset by it. Not that I necessarily dislike Trevor Davis. I've been a Trevor Davis supporter insofar as I think it's valuable to have a, a decent return man, but I, I'm not overly upset by it because, as you can tell, very few opportunities in general, especially if you're a good returner, they're just not going to kick it to you. Um, we've seen on several punts that the punts are just high enough that there's somebody there. I think our special teams unit has actually been pretty poor as far as blocking for him because every time there's a punt, um, my hope is that he's going to have some somewhere to run and you can see the guys are just well around our blockers who are just trailing behind, whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, but I, I, I genuinely believe, and I went into why I believe this and why I was kind of starting to wonder about Trevor Davis, but I, I genuinely believe they were ready to move on. They were planning on cutting him and, um, essentially they just started shopping him. Um, and I think, I think Oakland probably knew that the Packers were, I mean, you don't really shop a guy that you're intending to keep anyways, but the point is you kind of try to develop a market for him because if, if, a team knows that you're going to cut them, you could just wait, but then you could also lose them. And I think Trevor Davis has enough value that um, there was a decent market. And the reason I think a sixth is work it, worth it is because if you just want to, you always start low, right? It's kind of like in fantasy football where, you know, you have sometimes that system where on the waivers you have to bid. If you're bidding on someone that nobody's going to want, you could probably get away with doing nothing, which is essentially the same as as just letting them cut them. But if you think there might be some, you could just put a dollar out there just to try to beat anybody that doesn't bid anything, which is kind of like a seventh round pick or a conditional seventh or whatever. Um, a sixth tells me that it kind of got run up a little bit. And um, in other words, maybe there was enough interest generated that um, we could work up this basically no value to a seventh round value to a sixth round value 
So I'm kind of good with it. Obviously, we don't get a ton for six-round picks, but there's always potential, right? I mean, Ty Summers is a seventh-round pick. Some people are super jacked about him. I mean, Kadar Holman and Dexter Williams are both six-round picks. So, there, I mean, potential with both of those guys. Aquanimius is a six-round pick. Ripkowski is actually decent six-round picks, man. James Starks was a sixth-round pick. Desmond Bishop and Mason Crosby. Johnny Jolly. Dude, we we nail the sixth round. I mean, considering I expect nothing in the sixth round, that's not bad. So, anyways, it, it's it's not nothing. And, again, I genuinely believe that they were intending to move on. And, and more details you can find in yesterday's little blurb. So, anyways, we'll see how it goes. This may also possibly um, give us some kind of indication that perhaps Darius Shepard is... Um, is going to be ready to go. It sounds like I, I said in the thing that he was um, officially injured, as in some kind of pup or IR or whatever. I, I guess he's just he was just limping around, but uh, he's he's actually practicing now in limited capacity. But um, it, it it may be an indication that maybe he's kind of ready to go, and with the um, the addition of Tremont Smith, that may be something to keep an eye on. Anyways, the first uh, random little little question I had was as I was going through and doing my picks, I was kind of looking. And usually what I do is I just look at the matchup, especially on PFF. They've got this little color-coded chart showing kind of where everybody's at. And it's a little early in the season, so there's some anomalies, but I have a general idea of how good or bad people are, and you can kind of look at the history. But bottom line is I usually just start from nothing and then just say, eh, I think this team could beat this team, right? they got the wide receivers. They, you know, I think they could outscore them, whatever, whatever. I don't like to come from the standpoint of, well, what does everybody else think or what does Vegas think? Because that just, I don't know, just feels like cheating. But this week I did do that. I, I wanted to start from the baseline of what does Vegas say and then go in and look at it. And, and the bottom line is, as I'm going through, I'm pretty shocked to see how favorited the Packers are. I knew they would be favorites. I was thinking maybe, see, three points is, is basically home field advantage, right? I think that's how that's viewed. I'm not entirely sure if that's just what people say or if that's legitimate. But basically, if the teams are, are perfectly even, then the home team would get three points. I don't know. Again, I, I don't not super immersed in the betting world, so you can even tell my terminology is probably incorrect, but I don't really care. You get what I'm trying to say. But right now, they've got Green Bay over the Broncos at 7.5. Now, I this last two weeks, I, I mentioned that I won two cake bets. Somebody bet on the Bears, and I took the Packers. Somebody else came in and said, all right, well, this time the Vikings are going to beat them because they don't have garbage Trubisky and everything else to go against. I said, all right, we'll, we'll do it again. And uh, just yesterday, I got to enjoy some delicious Dairy Queen ice cream cake. Now, I couldn't get the guy to bite on this game. However, he said I would consider taking the line, and I don't want to. Now, PFF has their own line. They put it at, or you know, they put the uh, the spread at minus six and a half for the Packers. So they're not quite as as high on the matchup, I guess. The the thing here's the thing though. It feels, and I I respect Vegas, right? They they know a lot of stuff. They're really intelligent. I know it's not always. It sometimes it just has to do with trying to maximize the amount of money that they make, so it's not, I, I, I don't know, but it just surprises me. Because either way, even if you believe the Packers are going to win, and obviously most people do, it's not just a matter of will they win, it's a matter of by how much. And by all accounts, the Packers' offense has been terrible, and by all accounts, the Broncos' defense is quite good. And then you add in the Vic Fangio effect, which I think is a little overstated, and I'll touch on that, I think, in a little bit, I don't know. I keep saying I'm going to touch on stuff, and then I don't. But I'd like to at some point. And the fact of the matter is, I, I just, it seems odd to me that somebody would expect, especially the, the Vegas line, of not just winning by a touchdown, but more than a touchdown. It's at seven and a half. So the bottom line is it actually gave me a lot of confidence. Because again, I think the, the Vegas folks are um, in a, a multi-billion dollar industry, and they have the absolute best of the best who are trying to really break this whole thing down they've looked at every single angle of this thing and this is what they came up with this is the spread they came up with and um it's it's kind of got me excited because again i i just i really don't see that a win absolutely i expect a win but i i see it as a very very close win and certainly not a guarantee again i thought joe flacco looked really good last week against the bears um emmanuel sanders so basically everything i've said up, up to the point where i said that von miller is is about as good as khalil mack because he's been struggling but generally i believe that to be true and i do intest- anticipate him being a massive problem this week i hope i'm wrong but you have to assume he's going to be because he has that talent but the bottom line is i said joe flacco was underrated not good but underrated and he has been 
He's capable enough. And I've said that Emmanuel Sanders is a good wide receiver, and he's been carving people up. He had a great week last week, and Joe Flacco's a good enough guy to be able to get the ball where it needs to go, that if Emmanuel can get some separation, we're in business. Now, is he going to be you know, as, as tough of a matchup for Jair as Adam Thielen? No, I don't believe that to be true. And we'll get more into this matchup later. But I, bottom line is I was, just, I was kind of stunned because I'm coming into this with a very cautious approach. The, the team looks good. The defense looks great, and I think the defense should be able to match up with the Broncos. But as far as, as running up the score, that implies some level of confidence in the offense against the Broncos' defense, and I just don't necessarily see that. And I think we could get into a situation where if the Broncos are able to stop the Packers' offense, similar to what the Bears were able to do, it's not impossible to believe, because I'm, I'm not saying that Joe Flacco um, has some kind of incredible elite ability, but, the, you know, they've... They've got at least as good of an offensive line, probably better than the Vikings. They've had a lot of struggles lately, but I would say it's better than the Vikings. Very talented running back, a good wide receiver, a a, a capable quarterback. It's not impossible to think that they can squeak out 13 points. So again, you know, out of 10, the Packers win, what, seven times? But still, I, I just, I don't know. Surprised and very excited to see that the Packers are favored by that much, considering the the level of struggles that they've still had up to this point. I believe I did mention this yesterday, but I wanted to uh, bring it up again because I'm not sure in what detail I said it. But having looked at all of the, uh, I'm trying to think of a good term. I I think win rate actually makes the most sense. When you're trying to get a pressure on the quarterback, how many times are you able to do it? And Kyler Fackrell leads the league in pressures off the edge. Now, there is one guy that is higher, but um, if you filter it out based on essentially 20% of what the highest rep is, in other words, just trying to get the five, six, seven pass rush attempts out of the uh, out of this list, Fackrell does lead the league. Now it's a somewhat small sample size. I think it's 21 attempts, six pressures on 21 attempts, but it's around 28% of his um, snaps are getting pressures. That's incredibly impressive, and it's also extremely exciting because, and I may have mentioned this yesterday, but the problem with Fackrell and why it wasn't necessarily believable is that he had an unsustainably high sack rate. In other words. If he pressured the quarterback, you know, six times, let's say, then two or three of his pressures would have been sacks. Whereas maybe six pressures isn't impressive, but when he gets to the quarterback, he's usually going to bring him down. So he's not actually getting a lot of pressure. He's not actually beating the tackle very often. He's actually losing most of the time. However, when he beats the tackle, he's going to get, he's going to get a sack, which sort of falsely inflates how good of a job he was doing off the edge. This is the exact opposite. He doesn't have any sacks. Nobody is seeing him really do anything. In the video that I posted, I highlighted his ability to cover, but essentially everybody's just looking at him as some kind of below-average garbage pass rusher and are looking at this as saying, well, why is Gary behind Fackrell? If he was so good, he'd be above Fackrell. Fackrell's doing a really, really good job, and he's actually overcoming the issue where you look at it and say, well, he's getting a lot of sacks, but he's not actually that good at pressuring the quarterback. No, at, at this particular point in time, he is number one in the NFL at doing that. That is fantastic, and it's it's unsustainable. It's going to fall, but the other exciting thing about this is that out of, I think there was like 130-some total edge rushers, um, all the Packers pass rushers, including Kyler Fackrell, Rashawn Gary, Preston Smith, and Zadarius Smith are in the top 26. Preston Smith is 26th, and he has the lowest pressure rate of anybody, or win rate, or whatever we're calling this. So, so far, everybody's doing fantastic. Most of this is inflated from the Bears game. I think Fackrell was primarily from the Vikings game, I'm not sure, but Rashawn Gary was mostly from the um, the Bears game. Obviously, Zadarius was from the Bears game. Rashawn's was from the Bears game. But if they can just even somewhat keep this up, and they've got another subpar offensive line coming up, they need to be able to, to generate some pressure. But I thought that that was really, really exciting and encouraging news. And, and again, this is a good situation for Gary. I don't know what he's going to be. I don't know if he's going to be any good. Um, I think right now he's very, very raw. I think a lot of his wins are coming off of raw athleticism. He needs to develop some, some pass rush techniques and moves and um, a better ability to time his punches and swat. You know, there was there was somebody had posted, um, I think it might have been Ben Fennel, but somebody posted something on Twitter essentially showing how he's, he's usually winning with athleticism and he, he, he's, he's not going to win with that every time. And he shows him trying to run around the, the tackle or whatever and essentially just runs right into his chest and gets locked up. But as he's running toward him, he swipes his hand and there's nothing there. 
right? Because the, the tackle is trying to time his punch. So he's holding his hands back and waiting and waiting and waiting. Rashawn swats it air, and then boom, he gets punched in the chest, and then he's locked up. Right, this is this is technique, and that tackle has been practicing technique for a long time. This is a very cerebral game. He's extremely athletic. He's going to win with athleticism sometime, but he's got to be able to develop a little bit more. And 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 this is these are things that take practice. And again, the exciting thing is he has the ability not only to take time because we don't need him out there, but um, he he has time to develop, and he has a lot of great people to learn from, not just Preston and Zadarius and Kyler but also uh, Mr. Mike Smith, who is a great teacher. So a lot to be excited about with our edge rushers. Um, I mentioned this is going to be very random. There's no order to this or, or any reason for this. So uh, I actually want to give a very quick NFL 2020 NFL draft update. I know it's early. Most people don't care, but I just want to keep everybody um, kind of up to speed on where we're at. As of right now, based on our record, the uh, the Packers have nine draft picks. Um Tankathon is a website that that takes into account not just your record but strength of schedule so far. They have the Packers picking 27th overall. Um, our picks would be 27, 58, 89, 124, 155, which is essentially pick 27 in rounds 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Then in round 6, we would have our pick at 186, but we also grabbed Oakland's, which is at currently pick 177. That's another team that essentially we just want to... Uh, to do really poorly because, um, you know, then we get a higher pick. And by the way, speaking of, I would never wish ill of anybody. I don't want anybody to get hurt. But Drew Brees has been an Iron Man for how long? He waits until the one year after we have their pick to get injured? Come on, man. Really? This is a guy who hasn't missed a game since, you know, peewee football when the girl on the other team called him ugly. And one year after we get the Saints' first-round pick, the guy just, whatever. I don't even care. I don't even care. It's not even a, whatever. No big deal. I didn't even want Nick Bosa. Not a big deal. He's probably a big loser. And uh, we have two seventh round picks, uh, 217, as well as the Baltimore Ravens seventh round pick of 221. That would be, I believe, from Ty Montgomery. If and I'm not mistaken, and another note uh, via Tony Pauline, apparently the Packers are very interested in a young man by the name of Curtis Weaver, who is an edge rusher from Boise State. Uh, Tony Pauline currently has a second round grade on him. Pro Football Focus, however, has him as the 28th overall prospect in the draft. So I understand that edge rusher is not our biggest need, but um, that's not the interest of Brian Gutekunst or the scouting department is to just look at people that we need. Um, they're just looking at, at really good football players. So if you're if you're jonesing for a little draft um, information or whatever or wanting to watch a little bit of tape, go check out Curtis Weaver because uh, that'll that'll give you some insight, not only in a guy that the Packers are interested in, but maybe, you know, style, that kind of stuff, what, what kind of a player they're looking for. Uh, next up on the agenda, there are a decent amount of injuries that are starting to, you know, really stack up in the NFL, as you've probably noticed. And so I think it would be worthwhile to kind of take a look at at least some of the upcoming games to see what's going on out there. So first of all, with the Denver Broncos, they're not necessarily immune to this. And in fact, they've, they've got a couple significant ones. As far as IR, first of all, Jake Butt, their tight end. Uh, Drew Locke, the backup. So if, if Flacco's having a terrible day, nobody's coming to save him. Uh, Theo Riddick, Billy Wynn, the defensive tackle. These guys are all on IR. There's several others. Uh, they have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten people on IR. So again, to the, the Packers are the most injured team in the history of the world. Just want to give you another update. Ten guys they have on IR. They have three players that are officially out. They've got uh, Joe Jones, who has played limited snaps, but has been relatively a decent football player, the linebacker. Um, Andy Janovich, their fullback, is out. And most importantly, Jawan James, their right tackle, is out. That's pretty big because Jawan James is a pretty good football player. On the opposite side, their left tackle, Garrett Bowles, who is a guy that a lot of people thought went way too early and they should not have taken him that early. Some people really liked him, but it was kind of debatable. He has been struggling massively. And if you watch that Bears game last week, the guy had like back to back to back to back holding calls it was it was really really unbelievable how many holding calls he had in that game in fact let's just look at it he had um he has five total penalties on the season he had four yesterday he only allowed four pressures but we kind of have to assume those four holding calls very likely were going to be pressures hits or sacks or hits hurries or sacks so um there's some opportunities off the edges garrett Bowles has not been doing a very good job of uh of of blocking thus far I mean, last year he was he was decent, and the year before, not great, but kind of decent. 
but he is he's really struggling this year and it's not just because it was the Bears he was having a rough time uh, against Oakland as well so again opportunities and then having the right tackle out is going to be a massive opportunity beyond that though Bryce Callahan uh, really really big uh, free agent acquisition from the Chicago Bears the one guy that really knows Vic Fangio's scheme great slot corner um, he is potentially out he right now is questionable and is limited as is Todd Davis another linebacker um, another guy that's currently injured is Ron Leary, who is right now their right guard. The, the whole offensive line has been struggling quite a bit. Again, a lot of this maybe has to do with the what the Bears did to them. But either way, Leary and Bowles are having a real tough go of it. Uh, the backup tackle is not doing well. And if, if Leary's out, then you have a guy who's not very good about to get replaced by somebody who's even worse. And it's just, it's, it's, it's potentially going to get ugly for the Broncos. Um, after that, we've got the Philadelphia Eagles. The Eagles have already lost Malik Jackson. He's on IR, um, as well as Mr. Richard Rodgers, who used to be a uh, Green Bay Packer. But there are some other question marks for the team right now, and some big names as well. Timmy Jernigan, Dallas Goddard, Deshaun Jackson, and Alshon Jeffrey. I'm thinking there's a good chance a lot of these guys are going to play, but it's it's one of those things where if, if, if even half of these guys or all of these guys end up being out in Week 4, that's going to be real tough for Philadelphia, especially against this revamped team. And then week five against Dallas, Xavier Woods and Michael Gallup. After that, you kind of get into a situation where a lot of the guys that are injured are going to end up being back. However, a couple other things that we need to keep an eye on. Number one is Eric Fisher. Eric Fisher is one of the top tackles in the NFL. Um, he's got an injury that I believe is possibly going to be requiring surgery. It could be six to eight week kind of an injury. Not really sure exactly what his timetable is, but there is a chance that he will not be back for the, the game against the Green Bay Packers. Not to say that that makes the Chiefs a bad football team, but that is going to severely hinder them and their ability to, you know, win. So that's something to keep an eye on. The other one is Mr. Daniel Jones with the Giants. Now, the, the Giants' defense is their biggest deficiency. However, the second biggest deficiency is Eli Manning because I do think they have a relatively talented offense. It's not a great offense. If they didn't ship off Odell Beckham, it would probably be a potentially great offense. Nobody's talking to you, Google. Please go away. She just pops up like, did you need me? No. When, when, when did I say Google? Never in my life. Get out of my face. It's showing me results for Odell Beckham. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Wasn't asking you. So nosy. Mind your business, spy. Tell the CIA to get their own truth. But if he ends up being a pretty good quarterback, that somewhat changes the dynamic, at least insofar as right now it's basically a guaranteed win pending massive injuries. If Daniel Jones becomes a quality quarterback, then it kind of changes that a little bit, at least as far as something that maybe we should keep an eye on. Anyways, why don't we take our second break real quick, and then we'll wrap up a couple last little tidbits of informaciones. I know how to say it. I'm fluent in nine languages. Get out of my face. Uh, the next thing I wanted to cover, I, I so every week what I've been doing is tracking the rookie data. Something else I keep saying I'm going to throw in the uh, premium Facebook group, but I've forgotten to do several times now. But I have a week one grades, week two grades, and then overall grades. A couple notes. Elton Jenkins and Darnell Savage were two of only 21 rookies to be given a good grade. Now, part of the reason I want to do this is because I, I personally am stunned at, at the quality of play from the rookies because it's basically garbage. Now, granted, it's probably par for the course for the NFL because most players are not going to be very good. There's a lot of, of really not great players out there that nobody talks about because they're not great. But we're talking about like 254 people that were drafted. We're getting, I think it was last week was 13, this week 21. That's it. The only play, the, Those are the players that are, are graded as good. Um, second note. Darnell Savage is one of only three, and I mentioned this before, one of only three out of 254 prospects that graded out as good two weeks in a row. Josh Jacobs, Anthony Nelson, I guess it's four. I don't know how to count. One of four because there's three others. The three others are Josh Jacobs with the Raiders, Anthony Nelson with, I don't remember, Tampa Bay, I think, edge rusher, and then Terry McLaurin, wide receiver with uh, Baltimore or Washington, one of the two. I think it's Baltimore. Um, Darnell Savage is the second highest graded rookie first round pick on defense. So there's a lot of qualifying things there, but it's still some more exciting news for Mr. Darnell Savage. Also should be noted, non necessarily rookie related, Darnell Savage is the 16th overall safety period. So not only is he one of the best um, draft picks through two weeks period, but he is um, one of the top safeties in the NFL right now. Random fact of the day, number six. 
According to um, the NFL and their advanced technology, Aaron Jones was the fifth fastest player in week two. They tracked the, the, um, the top speeds of all the players that were running on the field. Aaron Jones was fifth. The reason I find that interesting is because it really just goes to show you that 40 times aren't necessarily the end-all be-all. Marquez Valdez, we, we, we can list by name the players just on the Packers that ran faster 40 times than Aaron Jones. Darnell Savage running at full speed to make a tackle. MVS. Right, where, where are all these guys that are on our team, much less the rest of the NFL, who have much faster times? The wide receivers running four twos. How does Aaron Jones get the fifth fastest time? Bottom line is we just put too much stock in that, uh, you know, that first of all, people aren't generally running 40 yards, and um, also people aren't in a full dead sprint the entire game. Uh, fatigue and all these other things come into play for this kind of stuff. Aaron Jones is fast, and we've seen it. I remember seeing his 40 time and thinking, I don't know how he's able to consistently beat people to the outside. That was his whole rookie year was just beating people to the outside. It's like, how is he doing that? Because he's really, really fast. It's not reflected necessarily in his 40 time, but... Um, the guy's got some wheels, and that was pretty exciting and shocking to see that he was the fifth fastest player in the NFL last week. Um, and then speaking of running backs, there was some news from the Matt LaFleur press conference that has everybody upset, and uh, Matt LaFleur essentially said that he wants to try to even out the carries between Aaron Jones and um, Jamal Williams, which has people all upset because that's what Mike McCarthy did, and it was very upsetting because Aaron Jones is obviously the better running back. He's the guy that you give more carries to. He's eventually going to break one. He's going to kind of flip this thing on its head. Jamal's just going to dive forward for three yards. That's not going to do very much. And uh, somebody also brought up the fact that uh, this is upsetting, not only because this is what the Packers did last year, but it's also what Lafleur did last year. He wanted to even out the carries, despite the fact that he had Derrick Henry, who was clearly the best running back. He didn't figure it out until the end of the year when he unleashed Derrick Henry, and Derrick Henry essentially tore up the NFL. Now, to be fair, it... it This is essentially what he wants to happen here as well, right? He wants to keep Aaron Jones healthy. Why? For the end of the year. So to say he didn't learn from his mistake last year, maybe he didn't make a mistake last year and he's doing the same thing he did last year. But uh, that is a little bit, I guess, kind of upsetting. And again, I keep bringing it up and I don't want to have to bring it up, but it is worth mentioning this should be something to think about. Maybe this is all running backs. Maybe this would be his philosophy no matter who the running back is, that we just want to keep guys fresh and we want to be able to have a rotation But that does sort of of bring to mind the idea of drafting a running back. Maybe not in the first round, because if we're going to have a committee to try to keep people healthy, you don't want to have to have a guy like Travis Etienne or DeAndre Swift or whoever that, you know, you want to have the... A guy that's only going to get 8, 9, 10 carries a game because we're using a committee approach. With that, you you maybe third, fourth round, because you want to at least have guys that we can um, upgrade Jamal with maybe. I don't know, but the, the bottom line is right now we're trying to run a committee with a guy that has injury concerns that we're trying to put on a snap count and another guy that's going to get us three yards and down and then another guy who just doesn't seem to be up to speed yet, Dexter Williams, although he does look very explosive when he can do it right. It just seems like he just doesn't have this thing figured out and he's just not at all ready to go. But um, expect that if you have Aaron Jones on your fantasy team. I'm very sorry. I expected a lot from him as well. He could still get some points. If he breaks some big gainers and gets touchdowns, et cetera, et cetera. But um, the expectation, at least for this point in time, we'll see what happens toward the end of the year. But the expectation is he's going to get his, his touches dialed back. I think he had 22 carries last week, which is just insane. And I, you know, I, I really think that could be a part of it, too, because regardless of the running back, at 22 carries, you're starting to look at it going, yeah, that's, that's much. That's kind of a lot. I mean, even if, think about it, even if we dial it back to just like 17 or 18, it's still way more than McCarthy's 12, but it's also like we need to lighten his load a little bit and give some of those to Jamal because that's just too much. Because he's, he, we won't have him when it matters the most, right? When, when we really need it in the playoffs is when, you know, Aaron Jones is going to be wore down, possibly injured, whatever. We, we need to make sure that's not the case because we don't want to have to go through the playoffs with just Jamal Williams and, and Dexter Williams. No offense to to those guys, but that's not going to be super ideal. So anyways, that's pretty much all I got. Again, just kind of random grab baggy kind of stuff. I wanted to get into some questions and comments from the Facebook group and uh, those kinds of things, but it's just hard to find the time right now. Anyways, you folks have yourselves a fantastic time with whatever it is you're planning on doing. We got football today. Nobody probably cares, but it's something to do if you're bored. Have yourselves a good day. Talk to you tomorrow. Bye-bye.